which means we've got to wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plains of the internet. Before we go ahead and get started, it's Monday, which means the internet tubes are always a little bit clogged. So sometimes they take a minute or two longer than they should for things to get moving. But it looks like they're rocking and rolling. We're coming up on YouTube. We're on Facebook. We're on Odyssey, Rumble, and Twitter. And Twitch is just around the corner, but it looks like there it is. So we can go ahead and jump into it. Let's get going. Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Gruler. I am a criminal defense attorney here at the r r Law Group in the always beautiful and sunny Scottsdale, Arizona. And today we're talking about Glenn Maxwell trial day six. We've got a lot to get into. We've got prosecutors now are kind of changing the way they're going to court. They're walking together in groups. And so we're going to check in about all the attendees at the trial. It's the usual suspects. We've got Maureen Comey. We've got Pomerantz was testifying today or was leading the direct exam during testimony today. We've got Maxwell's siblings who are they? Uh, we've got Isabella, we've got Max, we've got Menninger, we've got Pagliuca, all the regular crew is back in court for trial day six. We're going to go through several different witnesses, but we've got to get through a little bit of the heavy lifting first. There was some exhibits that were in question. Remember, last week we talked about Detective Dawson. We went through a lot of different pictures and things. We're going to re revisit a lot of those images because those exhibits are now out at a part of the public record. And so we're going to be able to go through those. But there was a lot of battling over those photos. If you remember this last week, a lot of conversation about, well, that picture that we see in that photo, those were a little bit, you know, not good for jurors to see. And so the defense wanted to keep some of those things out. Government wanted to keep those things in. And so we've got actually some of the photos that were released to the jurors in trial. We're going to go through all of those today. We're going to check in again, of course, with Good Logic, Joe Nearman. He's boots on the ground over there. We've got government prosecutors. They call somebody else called Patrick McHugh. He's a Chase bank executive. This guy was funneling money or, or not funneling, let's say handling transactions for Epstein and Glenn and funnel and uh, moving money around for them. Glenn Maxwell got something like $5 million out of the whole deal. And so uh, we'll go through that. And then at the very end of the day, we had two different FBI agents, somebody called Kelly McGuire, that was a part of a 2019 Epstein raid. So again, we're talking a ton about Epstein. And if you recall, of course, he was being prosecuted for criminal charges. In 2019, his New York apartment was raided. And so the same thing that we did with Mr. Parkinson, the CSI, the crime scene and investigator, for the Palm Beach residents, we're going to do the same thing with the New York residents. We're going to have the police go in, they raid the place, they bring out a bunch of evidence, and we're going to be able to unpack all of that with these FBI agent witnesses. And so we've got a lot to get into. We're also going to take a look at the mind map, and I've got a story to share with you about this mind map thing. I stepped in it, folks. I made a fool of myself, and I'm looking forward to telling you about that. But if you want to be a part of the show, the place to do that is over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. And here is the form, and you can ask a question, get that submitted, and we'll be sure that we get to that. We're also taking Super Chats. Of course, we're on YouTube. So Super Chats, they look like that when they pop up on the screen. And you've got some dad said uh, this last week. And so you can see exactly what that looks like. So if you want to support the show, Either way, certainly appreciate that. Other reminder that we've got clips that go out. So clips go out of the individual witnesses since we're sort of in trial season, we're covering trials and we're going to be clipping these segments up. So if you want to look at what, you know, what Kate said, for example, or what Jane said, for example, you can just go to our clips channel. These are also a lot more shareable, so you can share those with your friends and your family. But first, let's talk about this mind map business. So I've got some interesting news, some cool developments that I've sort of uncovered over the weekend with this mind map stuff, because a lot of people have uh, reached out and said, hey, I want, you know, can I, can I access that? Can I see some of that? And so I've got some updates on that. While I was going through this process, I absolutely embarrassed myself badly. And it, it uh, involves YouTube and it involves uh, me eating crow. So we're going to do it right now. Let's get into the, the story here. First, let's take a look at the update from the mind map. So as we have talked about previously, this is what it looks like. There's a lot going on here. The name of this software is called Mind Meister. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's free. You can pay to upgrade it and all this stuff. And what I wanted to do with this, my sort of vision for the software, was that it is 
collaborative so that people can work together on it and see it. You know, it's cool if I show it on the, on the show, but it's also cooler if you, as somebody who's watching the show, can poke in here and play around with the mind map. If you can navigate through it and sort of uh, click on a link, and this is Annie Farmer, we click a link, it opens up the link. We can click on the notes for Jane and read some of the notes that I wrote in there for Jane. All right, so you know, allowing you to sort of you know poke through this if you'd like to do that. And so I wanted to figure out how to share this. And so this is new software uh, for me. I played around with it a long time ago, but they've updated a lot of it. And so I, I wanted to be able to share it. As you can see, I figured it out. Eureka! So I can, in fact, share this with people. And you can see there are people popping in and out of this uh, right up here right now. You've got guest 25 is here. We've got guest 26 is here. And so this is available on our locals community. So if you want the link to this, you join over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com and then you're gonna get this link and you can poke around, right? So sounds great, sounds cool. And I put a lot of work into this puppy and we're gonna talk about you know a lot of this today, but I put a lot of work into this. And so as I was thinking about this, it, it, I was thinking, okay, so if I'm gonna be sharing this, I want to make sure that I'm sort of protecting this. You know, I want to make sure that somebody can't just, you know, add a node, you know, just kind of go in here and, you know, just add a node to this thing and then just say, hey, oh, that's not Rob's mind map anymore. Now that's, um, you know, Mr. Uh, twin torpedoes mind map or something like that you know sort of you know protecting your ip or something and so i was playing around with these sharing settings like these invite settings and you know the share link and all these different things and i was asking a friend of mine so i sent him a, a message on twitter as I'm, I'm as i'm experimenting with the software i say okay i click this button i created these shares uh, these sharing links and all this stuff and so I, I want to test this to you. Hey, I'm going to send you this link. If I send this to you, I want to make sure that you just can't copy this, right? I want to make sure that you just can't take this mind map and copy it right into your own account and sort of, you know, kind of steal it. In other words, that you can't just make this your own because I put a lot of work into this puppy. And if this is going to be spreading all over the internet, then I want to make sure that people, you know, get funneled back to our community, that it's a value add for our community, all that stuff. So I say, Hey, can you just check this? If I, I, I sent him a message on Twitter, Hey, if you're there, can you just check this for me and make sure that, you know, you can't just sort of copy the whole thing or, you know, export the whole thing and just kind of steal the whole thing. But if, you know, but certainly I want to make it available for people to use and be a part of. And so you might say that that sounds perfectly reasonable, right? Not even a big deal, which is true if I would have sent that message to my friend. But guess what happened? I didn't send that message to my friend. Guess who I sent that message to saying, I want to make sure that people don't copy my stuff. Who, I, who did I send that to? I want to make sure that people don't copy my stuff. Well, I happened to send it to a group message with 16 other YouTube lawyers in it. Oh, telling them, I hope, essentially, I hope nobody copies my stuff to the entire group chat. All of them, all the other lawyers on YouTube, 16, 18 of them, I, I mean, maybe all of them. I'm not sure if I got all of them in there. So I, 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 did, I realized it like an hour later. I'm like, oh, this is weird. What? <laughs> and nobody responded. They all just let it sit there like a big fat meatball. Just let it hit, sit there. So after the gym this morning, uh, Branco was on there. Look, everybody, got, folks, everybody. All, if you watch any legal news on YouTube, everybody, the whole, the whole stinking community, all of them. Barnes, Good Logic's on there. Yeah, I'm looking at the chat. We've got Viva, Ricada. We've got the whole, the whole community. The whole community's out there. And nobody said anything. So then I realize it. I'm like, oh my God, what have I done? What have I done? And so I, I, Nate, the lawyers in there. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. Legal bites, uh, Bronca's on there. Uh, you name it. The whole, the whole, the whole community is there. So I send that message to all of them. And then I go into like, you know, psycho panic mode. I'm like, Oh God, what have I done? My stomach dropped. Like literally I was sick to my stomach about it and, and it drops. And I'm like, Oh, so I sent him a message guys. I wasn't talking about you. I was like, and, and to be, to be perfectly fair about this, I 100% was not talking about them. You know, if they want any of this stuff, it's free. I'm sharing it with everybody anyways. But, but it was sort of like a, like a principle of the thing, you know, that I just wanted to make sure that this wouldn't, uh, 
No, Legal Eagle is not a party of it. He's not a real lawyer, as far as I can tell. I think he's just a YouTuber, but he's not a part of this group. So, so you know, look, I, I, I genuinely was not meaning it to, to anybody in that group. And I mean that sincerely from the bottom of my heart. First of all, first of all, everybody in that group is like a level 10 creativity beyond me. Okay, I'm not that creative. Everybody else in that community is a lot more creative. Look at their backgrounds and look what they do with their with with what, what they're doing. I'm like the most generic, boring, robotic guy on the planet. So I wasn't trying to. No, nobody would take it or steal it anyways. Okay, which is what makes it so insulting. Like that's what's so insulting about this is I send it to them like I'm not going to steal your crap, loser. Nobody wants this. Nobody wants your crap. Nobody wants your mind maps, dork. So you know they're just going to you know. But it's very insulting. A lot of very you know accomplished people in there. Oh, man. So from the bottom of my heart, I mean, I mean, it. I, I tell them all the time. I tell everybody on LawTube that, you know, they, they inspire me. I mean that a lot. You know, doing this, doing this type of work is not that easy. Candidly, I know a lot of them make it look like it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of work. And, you know, there are times when when I sort of feel like I'm sort of you know, coming down on myself or running out of energy or running out of steam or whatever. And I look around to everybody in that group, in that community. And, you know, they're always just going, man. They're always going. And so they're inspirational. I just wanted to formally apologize officially to everybody in that group. I mean, every single person, a part of LawTube, I was not intending to be uh, insulting to you. I don't think that anybody would would want any of my stuff anyways. You're welcome to it. It's, it's open to everybody. But I just want to apologize. I love you all. Keep inspiring me. Keep doing the great work. Please accept my apologies. Now, to be to be fair, we're going to get to the trial, Jackie. Take, it, take a quick second. I... <laughs> Take a second. They're probably they're probably formulating an indictment against me right now. So we're going to uh, we're going to to clear the air on that. Formal apologies to all of my friends over there on LawTube, but I, I deserve to be beat up about it. All right, all right. So now let's get into the trial for the day, shall we? All right. Galen Maxwell trial day six. We've got a lot to get to. Let's see who attended the court proceedings. We've got Addy ads over on youtube one addy ads says for the first time this trial he's on the streets he's on the he's on the ground he's watching this from outside the courtroom he says for the first time this trial the prosecution arrives in mass for the media including maureen comey she's the daughter of former director james comey so every time that maureen's comey names come comes up now uh we're going to be seeing that that statement. In other words, Maureen Comey is never going to be able to live without being called the daughter of James Comey. So you're going to see that they are actually walking together. And this prosecutor or this assistant is carrying something in a weird red box covered up with a bunch of stuff. Here's what it looked like this morning. Uh, I don't think there's any audio on this. Yeah, no audio that I was able to grab from this. So you see Maureen Mo uh, Comey sort of walking into the courtroom. She's all masked up. Let me get that watermark in there. Uh, Addy Ads on Twitter. Make sure you go follow him. He's down there. He's been there for a uh, for a long time, and he's doing good work. So he's sort of covering the prosecutors, making their way into court. I think here he's got the defense attorneys who are also coming in. Got some sound on this one. Yeah, so you can see it looks like Laura Menninger and Jeff Paliuka are right there. So, you know, kind of in their face. And then we've got, uh, this is Max. And then we've got Isabel all making their way into court. So it's been sort of a long weekend. There was actually a lot of activity this weekend talking about uh, some motions and some and some things that you know had to be filed back and forth. But we've got, this is Max making his way to court. We've got Isabella making her way to court. And if you remember, we have to do a quick backtrack on the testimony that wrapped up on Friday. Remember on Friday, the name of that show was the Twin Torpedo Show. Yeah, that's because we were talking about Michael Dawson. And that's when we saw a picture when his testimony came out on Friday saying that they introduced a photograph of Epstein's toys and the brand name is called the Twin Torpedoes. Remember this guy, Michael Dawson? Yeah, we spent a lot of time talking about this, this box, you know, and, this, and, this, and this, this concept here. Michael Dawson was the last guy who came out 
to testify. And this was part of the detective. If you recall, it went crime scene investigator Gregory Parkinson, then it went to Michael Dawson. And Michael Dawson was the detective who was really kind of explaining all the photographs that were taken in the video as he was going through the Palm Beach property that Epstein had. And he revealed this twin torpedo stuff. So we're having a conversation about those photographs. He's walking around, there's video, he's video, videoing and picturing the entire residence. So we're going to have to have conversations about that specifically, about those photographs. What about the pictures of the torpedo uh, and that pickle and, uh, and those tapes over there? What are we going to do with that, that art uh, painting of you know, bodies sort of embracing one another that's on the uh, uh, wall into the Epstein's bedroom. What are we going to do about all that? So inner city press, of course, on Twitter, he's there viewing this stuff. He gives us one of the best play by plays that's out there, almost like transcript level qualities. So go give him a follow on Twitter at inner city press. And he says, all right, now before the jury comes in, we're warming up this morning, day six, Glenn Maxwell trial. Nathan is reading rulings on exhibits, which is exactly what we were talking about from Dawson's testimony, talking specifically about the pictures on the wall. Judge Nathan comes out and says, all right, you know those pictures on the wall of Epstein's massage room? I think that they're a little bit too much. They risk prejudice. They're going to distract the jury. So they are going to be redacted. Okay, so some of the images are going to be blanked out. Some of the photographs. The other photos, things of the, the uh, buzzing machines, the cylindrical buzzers, the court's going to exclude those. Okay, so the jurors are not going to see those photos of the torpedoes. Or, or maybe the torpedoes, or it says of the vibrators, the court's going to exclude those. So, you know, might be something else, but that's what we're getting from inner city press. Nathan says, I will also exclude the photos of the quote, creepy animals. Okay. So those photos also not coming in tigers, for example, those are idiosyncratic. The school uniforms, however, may be admissible. So remember as Dawson was going around through Epstein's property, there was some indication that there were school uniforms there that belonged to the school girls or let's say school girl uniforms. Don't know who exactly they belong to, but they were there. And so the defense is saying you can't even talk about those not relevant at all. Government, of course, wants that in because it shows that there's a propensity to, you know, I, I guess, indulge in things that involve uh, young girls. So they are now trying to get that stuff in. The judge tells us uh -oh, what I do. The judge tells us that it, it's going to depend on the testimony. So when somebody comes in and testifies, it's going to depend on what they say about whether or not those uh, those uh, uniforms, evidence of those uniforms can come in. Otherwise, the public's going to get redacted documents. You can see here that we're also talking about the stipulation for Mr. Dawson, Michael Dawson. He testified last week on Friday, and then he was excused. And so this was that same guy who was talking, you know, walk, uh, uh, I saw this in the closet. I saw that in the bedroom. I saw that in the master and a lot of that testimony was redacted I mean, we are, or under seal. We didn't see much of that. If you recall on Friday, there was like a whole blank uh, black hole time zone where nobody was tweeting. Nobody saw anything. It was just kind of dead air because they shut off the observation room from within the courtroom. They were showing, you know, sealed and redacted stuff and they just needed to uh, stop anybody from seeing it. So we have no idea what they were talking about. So now we get then Michael Dawson. So there's a question about his testimony about this box where we found it. And so they come to a conclusion and they enter into a stipulation. This is basically an agreement. They're saying, listen, we're going to uh, let Michael Dawson go. We know what Michael Dawson was, was going to testify about. We're not going to need him to come back and actually testify about it. We're just going to have to, uh, you know, communicate what he was going to say to the court. In other words, we're going to save Michael a trip back. The defense and the prosecution, we've talked about what we think he's going to say, and we've come to an agreement about what he was going to say, and we're just going to tell the jury that. We're not going to make him come and say it. We're just going to tell the jury what we agree that he would have said. Make sense? All right. So then Judge Nathan says, all right, fine. Bring the jurors in, and then please be seated. You may recall the last witness from Friday. The parties have a stipulation. They've agreed to something. I just showed you that document. Mr. Everdell, they go over to the, uh, Galen Maxwell's defense lawyer and they say, tell him what you agreed to there. Everdell says, all right. He stands up and he reads it. He says, it is hereby agreed to by U.S. Attorney Damian William and Maureen Comey, daughter of James Comey, and counsel and Galen Maxwell that the witness would have said that the cardboard box was found in the closet of a guest bedroom had items unopened, huh? And that's defendant exhibit B. 
So now we have a, it's sort of like one of those board games, you know, in the closet with a knife with the butler. Here it is. Here's what Damien said. We have a cardboard box found in the closet of a guest bedroom and it had items unopened. All right. That's a, that's a new exhibit. So what's in that box and what are we talking about? I don't know. Anybody's guess. Twin torpedoes, uh, school uniform. You know, I don't know. That's all we've got. But we do get up here inside that Palm Beach residence. So as I mentioned, as we're following this trial, we're going to be covering the, the actual proceedings. And then after that day's proceedings, they're going to be releasing the exhibits. Everything else is going to trickle out and we're just going to have to address it. And we're going to get to see it and we're going to get to add it to our mind map and we're going to get to sort of expand our knowledge on the case in real time, which is why this is a hard case to follow linearly. It makes a lot more sense if we can sort of update it in real time and watch the, the different branches grow. So what we see now are some of those exhibits that have finally been released. Government Exhibit 230. This is inside Epstein's residence. This was the Palm Beach residence back in the 1990s. And you can see it looks very 1990s and, it, you know, I mean, not particularly something that, you know, would, would, would suit my style or my taste, but uh, maybe in the 90s, I would have dug it. I don't know. So you can see that here he's got a lot of books. He's got a working desk. And, you know, a, a lot of these photographs and things we can we can sort of see, you know, a lot of this stuff has not been redacted. It's very, very, you know, generic stuff, random books. We've got uh, some magazines and stuff on the floor. Maybe they're looking at, you know, uh, coffee tables or mugs or whatever they're doing down there. And so you can just see kind of kind of vanilla, not, not too much going on here. We continue forward and we can start to, you know, meander around the house. And as you're playing, you know, I spy a whatever, you're going to see some kind of interesting things stand out a little bit. You're going to notice that we've got kind of, if you, if you look real close over here on this right, right above government exhibit 227, you're going to notice there's like almost a picture of like this weird pink animal down here. Kind of looks like a cartoon animal. It's got uh, a frame that has sort of some beads on it. Kind of looks like a, like a, like something you'd put in a child's room. Right. And that's, um, you know, kind of a weird thing for, for a guy like Epstein, you know, a, a multi-billionaire to have in his, uh, in his room. So a little bit strange. And you can see also you know, very, very nineties. We have kind of this old LCD monitor or whatever, you know, whatever technology that is. Uh, but the big green, some of the beach towels around, we carry on. Now we go back to government exhibit 271. And so we don't know what this is. You know, is this a, a guest bedroom or a master bedroom? You know, I haven't done sort of a, a, a deep dive analysis on any of this. I'm not sure that the data exists, but you can see again, very 1990s. We've got the phone next to the bed. Didn't have many cell phones or anything like that back then. You know, you weren't on Facebook then. You've got this big TV with that standard surround sound system, you know, the 5.1 surround. You got that tall silo fan, but not too much stands out except maybe, maybe these pillows, you know, these pillows sort of kind of have a, if you look closely, it kind of looks like a maybe a childish brand to it, you know, I don't know. So you know, another image, and again, they're just kind of moseying through the residence. And so you don't know what these books say, you don't know what's in the closet, you know, where they find the box, this, that, and the other. Then we start getting into, it kind of looks like a bathroom area, right? This doesn't look necessarily like a massage room. Although, you know, you, I'm certainly you could set up a massage table right there, that same massage table that we saw or heard about last week, you could set that up right there. And, uh, you know, you could, you, you could Epstein, I guess yourself out, but kind of weird. You also have this weird little pink, pink, uh, couch over here with these weird pink cushions. And if you look on the wall here, now you have some of this artwork that we're talking about. Now, of course, this is a family show PG rated. And so we've got a, you know, a number of photographs on there that look like bodies, but you know, everything is, is, uh, you know, censored and it looks like it's artwork, uh, like, uh, drawings and uh, a pastel or, or uh, I'm sorry, sculptures or, or, you know, sketches or whatever. And so, you know, no, no actual nudity or, or, you know, hardcore positions or anything, but you can st still certainly see that it's a little bit risque. You know, it's not something you'd put in your dining room on this wall. And so none of this stuff uh, apparently was redacted all this, you know, it's, it's, it's fair enough for the jurors to see kind of neutral, kind of plain stuff, nothing too weird, nothing too abnormal uh, over here in the medicine cabinet, you know, your standard razors and other toiletries, nothing to really write home about. You got your towels. There you go. So we also then move over into this room. Now this is sort of an office and this is government exhibit 238. Not too much stands out here either. 
but you can see sort of the length to what they went through. They went through everything. They probably looked in those drawers. They took photographs of, you know, everything. It's all the 1999, you know, 1990s towers and printers and monitors and keyboards and this, that, and the other. Uh, so again, not too much interesting there. We take a close up. We see some, a message, you know, message book. We see some blueprints in this area. We've got, you know, a big cylinder, some, maybe a, a modem, a cable modem over in this area toaster oven keyboards kind of just like a junk you know a standard junk corner we have another photograph of his desk and so you can see he's got a thesaurus because you couldn't just go to thesaurus.com to look that up uh, he's got a scanner over there i think i might have owned that version at one point we've got a number of different you know uh, writing tools in a computer and again not too much there uh, up here you can see we've got some, probably some other police officers in the scene who are participating in the rest of the raid. And then we get to this photo. You know, this photo is an interesting one because this sort of starts to look like something that might be closer to a massage room. Kind of, right? It's a bathroom. It looks like we've got some closets on the right side. We've got a lot of equipment down here. Uh, at the far end of this restroom, there's a tub down there. We've got, looks like a vanity to the right. We've got several different that is, you know, look, I, I don't know what any of this high tech gear is. I don't know what, what that is, you know, lasering this, that, or the other, I don't know, but it's looks like it's right in front of a massage bed. So we've got another interesting photo here. That's just a different angle of that same room. I think that we were in. So, you know, multiple angles of this room, which leads me to believe that maybe they found something in this room that they want to dial in on. You know, again, a lot of this testimony came in, in a way that is very, first of all, hardly even public and not not available for us to decipher it's hard to connect different exhibits to different testimony because we don't get to hear much of the testimony so we have another photograph down here in the hall and then we've got sort of another you know another weird photograph of a sort of an embrace it looks like hands around somebody's back kind of embracing their spinal cord a little bit and you know that's um curious we have another sculpture on the wall can't see what that is it's being blocked off by the lamp but a very you know yellow and interesting room and then this is the final photograph the final exhibit that we saw come out and again not too much you know to really write home about here so all this is is pretty you know pretty well sanitized uh we're not seeing not too much of, of really anything that stands out unusual other than you know kind of ugly 1990 1990s styles <sighs> but we got beach towels we got a lot more books and that's it and that's the Palm Beach mansion that we get to see. Now, the jurors and everybody else gets to see everything else, including uh, you know a lot more of the juicy stuff. But that's what we've got. And we're going to do all of that again, because at the end of today, we hear from a new FBI agent who is a person who was a part of the raid in 2019 that did the same thing in his 2019 New York apartment. So we're going to very likely see the, uh, you know, a similar set of exhibits be released from the court at some moment in time. So now that we're up to speed, now that we know that these exhibits came out, we've got some clarity on what exhibits you know, Dawson could have uh, communicated to the jurors. We now get to our first witness. We talk about Kate. Kate is not a victim, as we're going to see. She's just a witness who's also uh, using a pseudonym. She's also testifying pseudo-anonymously because she wants to protect her identity, even though she's not a named victim. And the judge has granted that ability for her. So let's go to Adam Classfield, who clarifies what is happening with Kate. Classfield says, the judge says the next anticipated witness is Kate. Now, she was over the age of consent. She was not a minor. Okay, this case is about minors. She was not a minor at the time. And they're arguing now about what she can talk about. Okay, so she's not a named victim in this case. Nathan says, I'm going to tell the jury, quote, I instruct you that the witness is not a victim of the crimes charged in the indictment. So though Kate was one of the four accusers, I'm referring to her as a witness here. Oh, OK. So maybe she was one of the four accusers. So it's hard to keep track of all this because she's sort of testifying in two different capacities. Judge Nathan then tells the jury Kate is not a victim of the crimes charged in the indictment. Oh, okay. So I guess she's not, in fact, one of the four accusers. And the government has been instructed not to testify about the details of any contact with Epstein of a certain variety. 
Okay. Kate is not a victim of the crimes charged in this indictment against Galen Maxwell. So then what is she here for? We're going to find out. Let's take a look at the court scene. This is what it looked like inside the courtroom. Witness Kate is being questioned by prosecutor Laura Pomerantz during the trial of Galen Maxwell. As we know, there is an order from Judge Allison Nathan, who we can see here, that is instructing all the sketch artists, do not draw the faces. But we get, uh, we get some pretty good detail on Galen. Galen's got the old squinty eye going on. Look at that. Oh, yeah, the old shifty eye. Hmm. What's going on over here, over my right shoulder? Very suspicious. Maybe she just doesn't want to be sketched. She's skeptical about it. Certainly looks like it. So they're having some more arguments about Kate. Kate is a complicated witness. And the government wants to be able to talk about certain stuff. And so I'm not going to spend too much time on this because there's a lot going on in these motions. But I just wanted to show you what happened over the weekend. So, of course, today it is trial day six. It is also December 6. But late last night, both sides were exchanging a flurry of motions. We had the defense and the government prosecutors fighting over this witness, in particular, Kate. So you can see here that on 12-5 Sunday, U.S. prosecutors, they sent a letter over to the court about witness three and their instructions. Paliuka then fired a letter right back, that's Galen Maxwell's attorney, fired a letter right back December 5th. Response to the government's letter. Oh, okay, now talking about another series of exhibits. And then you see late last night, before this morning, so they're, fi they're filing all this stuff. Late last night because this exhibit's going to come, um, this witness is going to come in today and testify. We have an order. The court's in receipt of the government's letter. They want to limit instruction for witnesses three anticipated testimony. So that same testimony that we were arguing about that the court ruled on, this is what they were fighting about. So they sent a letter. The government was ordered by the judge to file another letter. Then the defense was ordered to submit another letter. So yesterday, the government, their deadline was 4 p.m. The defense, their deadline, they had three hours to respond, 7 p.m. Also, they have to keep in mind rules of sealing documents so i mean even late last night sunday night before the witness comes out government says hey, uh, witness three's coming it's going to be kate fire this off we want to limit some of the testimony court says i'll consider it send you th this by four defense respond by seven judge makes a ruling by nine o'clock this morning very precise very very fast paced and very pristine like no complications We've already got a ruling on it. Think about how this is a little bit different than some of the trials we've watched in other courtrooms. In particular, for example, the Rittenhouse trial, where we fought over issues for weeks. This was one issue raised, multiple different laser focus motions, decision, witnesses called, testimony continues. That's the difference between the sort of the, 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 the caliber of cases and representation and, 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 and circumstances here. Galen Maxwell's in court. Now she's speaking to her defense attorney. This is Christian Everdell. This is prior to the testimony of Kate. So we see Galen with some glasses on now. First time I've seen that. Very interesting. She's got some glasses. She's masked up. And then Kate starts her testimony. So we know the government prosecutor is Laura Pomerantz. Witness testifying under the name Kate comes forward. Sketch artist, don't draw her. All right. Ms. Pomerant says, jurors, please pick up your binders. Turn to Exhibit 16. It's under seal. So we don't know what that is. Good morning, Kate. Can you tell me what kind of work do you do? Well, I work with women who are victims of trauma. What did you do before that? I was a musician and a singer. How'd you meet, meet Miss Maxwell? Well, I had a boyfriend introduce me to her when I was in Paris. And when did you next see Miss Maxwell? Okay, a few weeks later. I went to her home for tea. Saw a photo of her with a man with salt and pepper hair. Did you find out who it was? Yes, I did. Jeffrey Epstein. So we see a fast progression here from Inner City Press. He's on Twitter. Give him a follow. Basically starts off very casually. Okay, now you work with women who've been abused and facing trauma. 
as we're going to learn you faced. Very interesting. Pre prior to that, though, you were a musician and a singer. You ran into Miss Maxwell. She invited you over for tea. How'd that go? We go back over to Classfield now. Classfield says the tea invitation was to her house. Kate says, she seemed very exciting. She seemed to be everything I wanted to be. Kate said, I recall a photograph of a slightly older man with peppered and graying hair. That was Epstein. When they had tea, when Kate went over there, she says, I had a really lovely time and I felt special. And I felt that I found a new connection. It could be very meaningful for me. I left there feeling exhilarated, she says, like someone wanted to be her friend. Kate quoted Maxwell and Epstein, said, she said that he was a philanthropist and that he liked to help young people. Kate said that uh, Galen told her that you're exactly the type of person that Epstein would want to help. She was only 17 and that she was lonely and hadn't found a group of friends yet. And then it progresses now. This is all with Maxwell. She's having tea with Maxwell. She's having these conversations with Maxwell. But then... There comes a time. Did you ever meet Epstein? Yeah, I did, says Kate. He seemed to be like he was in his 40s. We met at Maxwell's townhouse. She invited me over. Epstein was in sweat clothes, speaking on the phone very loudly. Maxwell told him I was surprisingly strong for my size. So he asked for a massage. He said he liked it. Classfield tells it a different way, says... Maxwell went into Epstein. Epstein was over there at Maxwell's townhouse. Maxwell invites Kate over. As soon as Kate walks in, Epstein's on the phone in his sweats. So he is, is listening. Maxwell says, hey, Mr. Epstein, this is the girl that I told you about. She's strangely strong for her size. Asked what size she was. She responded that she's about 95 pounds. She said, why don't you give this feet a little squeeze to show him how strong you are? Give his feet just a little squeeze, says Maxwell. Pomerant says, and did you do that? Yes, I did, she says. Kate says that Epstein's massage therapist canceled and that Maxwell asked if she could fill in. Prosecutor says, were you a massage therapist at that time? No, she says, I was not. Then Maxwell told me that my hands were so strong. Oh, this is a different take from Inner City. Did she, did she, after that massage, did Maxwell tell you how long that Epstein, or how often Epstein needed massages? Maxwell's lawyer, objection, that's leading, sustained. So they skip over that. How often did he need massages? Well, we don't know. The judge skips over that. Prosecutor continues. What was Epstein wearing? It was a robe. He took it off. What was he wearing under that? Nothing. He was naked. Was Maxwell there? Yes. And did Epstein initiate sexual contact with you, Kate? Yes, he did. What happened next? Maxwell said, uh, how'd it go? Did you have fun? After it was over? During the massage, Classfield reports... Afterwards, same questions from Maxwell. Kate says that Maxwell sounded really pleased, and I was pleased that she was pleased. Then we get back to these outfits. During the massage, Laura Pomerant says, All right, Kate, when you gave Epstein this massage and when you were doing this stuff, did he give you anything to wear? Answer, I was given a schoolgirl outfit. Boom. Prosecutors get that in. Testimony is now made available. Kate describes it as a short pleated skirt, white socks, a shirt. All happened in Palm Beach, she says. Why did you put on that outfit? Kate says, I didn't know how to say no to that. I didn't know anybody in Florida. I'd never been to Palm Beach or Florida before. I wasn't sure if I said no, if I would have to leave or what the consequence there would be for not doing it. So I did. Later on, Kate says that Maxwell told me 
that I've got to find somebody to give Epstein massages of a different variety and that he needs those three times a day. Prosecutor says, when you first met Maxwell and Epstein, what did you think that they were? Boyfriend and girlfriend. Direct exam continues. Laura Pomerantz says, all right, Kate, what, tell, me, tell me what else Maxwell told you. Maxwell carries on. Maxwell told me, Kate, that she was friends with Prince Andrew, Donald Trump. The names would just come up in conversation. And did Epstein give you anything? Or, or how about Maxwell? What gifts did you receive from Maxwell? I got a small Prada bag for my 18th birthday. Oh, you did, huh? After you slept with Epstein? Yeah, after. Oh, a nice black Prada bag right after that act with Epstein. Convenient. Prosecutor says, were you given clothes? Yeah, it's a short skirt, school outfit, uniform. And did there come a time when you stopped communicating with Epstein? Yeah. How old were you? In my late 20s. And were you compensated, Kate, by the Epstein Victims Fund? Yes, I was. And are you planning to sue Maxwell, Kate? No, I'm not. Judge Nathan says, we're going to take a break now, jurors. Doesn't talk about snacks. So I'm not sure if they got Hot Pockets today or not. But, of course, go check out the podcast and the reporting from Inner City Press. So they go to a break. We're still in direct exam. We've got Laura Pomerantz. She's doing the direct exam of Kate. Still don't know who she is. An Epstein victim, a Maxwell victim, but not somebody who is a named victim in the indictment, apparently. So why are we talking about her? We're going to see. Adam Classfield picks up, says that we're back. Kate now, after the break, says, tell me about going to Epstein's Island. How old were you? I was in my early 20s at the time. And what did, uh, what island did you go to? She calls it Little St. Jeff. Talks about remembering the island. I remember seeing a blonde, slim girl who seemed far younger than me at the time, uh, very young. Kate at the time says that she was addicted to cocaine, alcohol, sleeping pills. This is on direct examination. Maxwell's attorney, as we learned during the opening argument, said that she used drugs during a period of time and that it fogged her memory, right? And so we've got now Kate saying, yeah, I was addicted back then. Alcohol, sleeping pills, cocaine, everything. And what was Bobby Sternheim's opening theme? Memory, money, and manipulation. Memory is the first one. A lot of I don't recalls from Jane. Going to be making that same argument here from Kate. It carries on. She asked, Kate, why are you testifying here today under a pseudonym? Why don't you use your real name? She's got a child. She does not want that child to be associated with this testimony. Boom, direct examination ends. And so we start asking ourselves, what exactly is Kate doing here in the government scheme of the line of questioning? They've got a number of different witnesses that they've called. But do you remember the one that stood out the most? We've got Dr. Lisa Rocchio. Why was she brought in? She laid out the framework for grooming. Remember this from the mind map, which you can go browse yourself if you'd like to get the link over at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. But what you can do is notice here, we've got those five elements laid out. Step one, identify. Step two, get access. Step three, lies, deception. Step four, physical touching. Step five, touching. So how does Kate fit in? Well, those elements of grooming, we heard all of that from Kate. And our good friend Joe Nearman over at Good Logic on YouTube was there in court today. Here's his reaction to that exact line of questioning that took place today. Here he is. Day six, and today we were introduced to Kate the pseudonym for the second alleged victim of Jeffrey Epstein. Now, she was of age at the time that she met 
Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. The purpose of bringing her in here seems to have been to show how Ghislaine was instrumental in the grooming process on behalf of trying to satisfy Jeffrey Epstein's insatiable sexual appetite. So we could check off our boxes and see step one. She was living in London and she was pretty much impoverished. She was taken to Paris on a trip with her boyfriend where she met Ghislaine and told her about her financial struggles and about her family difficulties. A couple of weeks later, she gets isolated, step two, by being invited to Ghislaine Maxwell's house and where she ends up being praised and complimented as to how special she is and how wonderful she is and getting all sorts of positive attention and told how Jeffrey Epstein can help make her grow into the woman that she's hoping to become. She then gets introduced to Jeffrey Epstein and we see that we already checked off box three with, with all the promises about how life is going to be so great by forming a relationship with Epstein. And when she meets him, she's, they compliment her strong hands and how she seems like she's much stronger than she looks. And that sets them up for step four. She's invited a couple weeks back to come to Ghislaine's Maxwell's house yet again, this time under a pretense that Epstein's masseuse had canceled. And since you have such strong hands, perhaps you can step in and fill in the void today. And no sooner does she get in there than Ghislaine walks her into the room, closes the door behind her, and she ends up experiencing a classic Epstein massage. Uh. Now, when she comes out, Ghislaine Maxwell shows that this was all a pretext and that she knew it was going to happen because she starts giddily laughing with her about how was it? Did you have fun? Wasn't it great? And trying to desensitize her. Step four. And finally, she describes how she was afraid to leave this relationship and was stuck there for 15 years because Love she knew it. how powerful Epstein was, what type of connections he had, and how she felt that she was scared to leave. So we can see how the state is trying to use Kate's story as a way of showing Ghislaine's direct involvement in the grooming process. And it seems that it probably was fairly effective. That's what I got for today. Catch you soon. Boom. Love that. And so that is some good legal analysis right there from Joe Nearman. Good logic on YouTube. And if you're on YouTube, he is uh, tagged down in the description. So make sure you head on over there and subscribe. You know, it's such an interesting thing to watch this trial because we're reading transcripts and sort of, uh, you know, reading reports from other journalists and he's actually there watching it. So if you want a full, well-rounded take on it, go follow Joe. And his analysis was spot on. I mean, basically what the government is doing is they're they're, they're doing a, a big Iraq. And so in law school, they teach you how to uh, do legal analysis. The way you do it is you identify what the issue is. What do you, what's the problem here? What's the issue? That's I. Then you say, well, what's the rule? We know what the issue is. Do we have a rule for that issue? We've got rules for everything in the law. I are, and then we say, well, what's the analysis or what's the application of the rule to the facts of this case? And then we come to a conclusion. And that's exactly what the government is doing here. They brought out Rocchio. They say, what's the issue? Grooming. What's the rule? These five elements. What's the application? Boom. You just heard it from Joe brilliantly applied every single one of sort of the, the different elements to Kate's testimony. And then the conclusion that the government wants you to walk away with is grooming. And guess who was involved in that? Maxwell because of her proximity to this entire situation. And so uh, again, Joe Nearman is over uh, uh, boots on the ground. So make sure you give him a follow. And as he was talking, I happened to check my Twitter DMs, given my ultimate blunder from this morning. And he says here, hmm. by the way, nobody in Latu was even remotely offended by you being protective of your work product. <laughs> and he says, I'd like to invite you back into the group. So I ejected from the group. I pulled the ejection cord from the group chat because I, 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 I blundered. I pulled it. I said, poof, poof, and I, I checked it out of there. Jo Joe is the Coast Guard. He's coming to save me. Thank you, Joe. Love you to death. <laughs> I appreciate you. Okay, so that was the direct examination of Kate. Wonder who that is. Now we have to go to the cross-examination. So remember that we've got two people on, uh, I'm sorry, two sides to this. And so one of the things that we're sort of missing in a lot of these are the redirect examination. So remember how this goes. It's the direct exam, government's case in chief still. They're calling their witnesses. They're calling a forward Kate. Now the defense gets to cross-examine her. And we've seen a pattern from the defense thus far. I mean, from what I can tell, what, what I can gather is that they're sort of they can be pretty aggressive with some of their witnesses. We heard this even from Joe and many other commentators out there that when, I think it was Jeff Paleyuka, the G is silent, when he was cross-examining Juan Alessi, Epstein's former housekeeper, he was pretty aggressive with them from, from the sound of it. 
you know, really sort of dialing down, digging into those depositions. You said this, and you said this, and you said this in 2019, but this, you're saying this now. And sort of, you know, really, really saying, well, you also, sounds like you bought, you bought a, uh, a multifamily property. You've got multi-millions of dollars. You've got a million dollar property investment. And you divorced your wife too. And you did all of these things, right? Very aggressive. And Joe and some people were also speculating that maybe it was a little too much. You know, maybe if you're beating up Juan Alessi and this guy has, you know, uh, English as a second language, he's got a thick accent. These, you know, white defense lawyers are beating him up over the English language. And he, he he's not trying to lie to anybody. He just doesn't speak the language. And maybe that comes off as, you know, offensive or rude to the jurors. And maybe that's just a little bit too, uh, too, too aggressive, in other words. And you have to sort of balance these things out, which is why you bring in these cases, as you're going to see, a woman to cross-examine a woman. We saw that when we had Jane, guess who cross-examined her? Laura Menninger. They didn't put Jeff Pagliuco up there. Pagliuco, the G is silent. Ugh. They're going to do the same thing now. It's cross-examination time. Guess who we get to hear from? Bobby Sternheim. She's now here. We're going to get a quick summary from this fella. He's at Inner City Press doing great work reporting. Here's what he had to say about Bobby Sternheim. He's going to give us a quick recap on Kate, but then he's going to tell us what, what Bobby, she kind of came out aggressive. She's setting the tone pretty aggressively. Here he is. Well, here we are, inner city press, here in Foley Square. It's the midday break in U.S. versus Ghislaine Maxwell. Um, on the witness stand all morning, pseudonymous witness Kate. Um, she was in London. Ghislaine Maxwell recruited her to give a massage and then sexual contact with Jeffrey Epstein. She was really seemed pretty devastated by it all. Devastated. But on cross-examination just now, Maxwell's lawyer known as uh, Bobby Sternheim, well-known Southern District uh, individual. Uh, she represents, you know, norm normal people under the uh, normal people under the Criminal Justice Act. Bobby Sternheim pretty much outed and and pretty much trashed uh, Kate. She said things like, uh, you were on drugs for 10 years, weren't you? Uh, didn't yeah. you marry an affluent restaurateur? To which uh, Bobby Sternheim said, said uh, well, a man who had two restaurants, I guess that makes you a restaurateur. Ooh, so you see that there? Now that's, that's one of those little lines that you're not gonna get in a transcript anywhere. You know, he's not gonna say that that's a, that's a legally necessary point whether the guy owns a restaurant and nobody cares about that. That's inconsequential to Maxwell's criminal case. He's not going to type that into a tweet, but it shows you what Bobby Sternheim was doing when she gets in there being very, very aggressive. So, Oh, uh, so your husband, he's a, uh, so in addition to all your millions and all this other money and his comp, blah, 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 your husband, he's also a restaurant tour, isn't he? Well, I don't know that he's a restaurant tour. Well, does he own two restaurants? Yeah, he does. Well, then I guess he's a restaurant tour, isn't he? I guess so. You know, it's like like beating her up over those little words. And, you know, you can see nobody's going to make a big deal of that as a reporter. But as a juror, you're sitting there going, dang, going for the jugular on this person here. And just, you know, it's probably like that. And, and you know, I, obviously I've never seen Bobby Sternheim sort of in action in this trial. Nobody has. But based on her credentials, I'm guessing that she is, uh, you know, knife fighting in there slicing and dicing every which way and his testimony gives us a hint of that so now that we know how that's going let's take a look back at the transcript bobby sternheim's in court all right kate you had a beautiful mother didn't you yes i did and your father was rich and you lived in belgravia section of london also right yes and you were an international model right on top of all that yeah i was a model and you're dating an older, prominent gentleman who was, what, Oxford classmate of Galen, right? <laughs> so you're, so your, your boyfriend back then was in, in Oxford. Got it. And you were a model for a UK version of, what, Victoria's Secret? So you're basically like, you know, supermodel extraordinaire. Uh, she says, no. Uh, the company failed almost right away. Oh, but you were a lingerie model, weren't you? Yes, I was. Okay, so it's like you showed your body off in... in scantily clad clothing or whatever she did like and bobby's gonna beat up on that okay this is just one module of the testimony but i'm guessing that she probably spent a good five minutes on that oh yeah and so what'd you do and so that required you to wear what 
uh, uh, well, they required me to wear, you know, um, uh, female cover-up cl- uh, underwear, under S- bras, right? You had to wear bras, didn't you? Yeah, and nothing else on your body, right? And you'd take pictures, and those pictures went out in magazines all over the world, didn't they? Yeah, they did. And you also had to wear uh, 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 panties or thongs, is that right? Yeah. And you had to put those and just like really just, you know, grinding that in there. It's not going to be as simple as, uh, but you were a lingerie model, right? Yes. No, no, no. They're going to open that up big time and they're going to play around with that. So basically what you're saying is you put on scant clothes and sold your body and your image for money. Is that about right? And, the you know, and, and she's going to just... Oof, I'm sure it was brutal. So Sternheim goes on and says, all right, Kate. So you're in a piano bar and you're discovered by the musician uh, Seal, right? She says, no. But you said that, though, that you acted in movies. Well, I did not have any speaking roles. You know, I, didn't, I didn't actually talk in the movies. Okay, but you were in a, in a movie with a very well-known UK actor, weren't you? Yes. Hmm. Yes, I was. Yeah. Okay. And you also spoke here, right here, publicly, in this courthouse, your name, didn't you? You used your name. You were invited by a judge in this courthouse, Judge Berman, to speak, and you spoke, didn't you? Yeah, I did. So the obvious question, why are you not speaking now? Why are you not using your name publicly? You spoke in your own name previously. You came here before. Judge Berman had you here. You came here. You were singing from the rooftops there, Kate. But now we're calling you Kate in this court. And now you don't want to talk. Why is that? Very curious. Why would somebody who was willing and and, and available to be publicly open and confronted and accountable now not suddenly? Why? Good question. Sternheim says, all right, and you've spoken with Guffrey, right? Virginia Robert Guffrey. Yeah, I did. Yeah, And you also used drugs for 10 years, didn't you? Yes, I did. And you dated other men, right? Yes, I dated other men. And you even married one of them. Are you asking me if I've been married? Well, you were with a prominent restaurateur, weren't you? Well, I was with a man who owned two restaurants. And as he tells us, Sternheim says, well, I guess that would make him a restaurateur, wouldn't it? That's plural. Sternheim keeps digging into this. All right, Kate. Didn't a tabloid encourage you to get a man connected to the royal family to buy cocaine? Did you set him up? Not exactly, she says. And that became a big tabloid spectacular, right? I suppose. Well, now you can identify that, right? Royal family, cocaine, tabloid, 1990s, buying cocaine, boom, there's her identity. Sternheim says, were you la- when were you last in contact with Epstein? Oh, I don't know, 30, my 30s. Give me a date, Bobby says. Give me a date. Well, I don't have a date. Okay, well, how old are you? 44. All right, well, here's the year. 44, subtract 14 years from that in your 30s, and it's in this range. And so, again, that module, this one tweet, is probably a whole big, just beating, beat, just roundhouses. Ba, ba, ba. So you don't even know? You don't even know when it was? I can't give you a date? Okay. So you were in your 30s. Were you 31? Were you 32? Were you 33? Were you 34? How about 35? How about 36? How about 37? All the way up. Well, I don't have a date. Oh, because you don't remember, right? Right. Exactly what I thought. And you just tie that right back to memory. Bullet point number one. I can't recall because I can't pin it down. Sternheim continues. Aren't you trying to get a victim's visa? Isn't this your name on this document? Uh, My visa application is based on extraordinary ability. Uh, Which one? Music teaching to treat trauma. Uh, So you're trying to get a victim's visa. In other words, you're trying to stay in this country on a victim's visa? Because you're a victim? So if you want, so, so let me get this straight. You want to be in this country, and the only mechanism that you're using right now to do this 
is to get a victim's visa. That would allow you to stay here. And if you're not a victim, then you don't get to stay here. Oh, no, it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with my extraordinary ability. What's that? Uh, music. Yeah, I teach music to treat trauma. Okay, so that's your extraordinary ability, Bobby says. Yeah, it is. And, and uh, what do you have to do to become a music teacher to treat trauma? In other words, any unlicensed music coach can get it, right? Okay. So maybe she's biased. Maybe she doesn't actually care one way or the other what happens to Maxwell or Epstein's. She just needs her victim's visa to go through. She just was applying for an application to be here. Victim's visa sounds pretty good. She was in the, in the entourage from the defense framing of Epstein and Maxwell. This is very convenient now for her. Paid a bunch of money already from a you know, big wealthy family. She wants to get a visa. She's using a victim's visa. And she's using some bizarre, ridiculous reason for it. Music teaching for trauma. What are you doing? Banging on drums, lady? Any unlicensed music coach can get it. Right? All right. So then Sternheim finishes and says, I got nothing further on this one. Redirect. Prosecutor comes out. They have a conversation briefly. And they wrap it up. Judge Nathan says, all right, let's take a break. No redirect on that, it looks like. So then we come back. They have lunch. We get our next witness. In a minute, let's see what we have here. Inner City Press is reporting. Next guy up is Patrick McHugh. We talk about a slew of financial exhibits. We've got one talking about $7.4 million that are going from Chase Morgan over to Epstein. All right, so this is the actual guy. Uh, we don't have a photograph for him. So Patrick McHugh is here, J.P. Chase Morgan. Once again, Laura Pomerantz is doing the questioning. Patrick McHugh says, I'm an officer of the firm. I can speak to who is to authorize access to the accounts and the like. So this is all going to be financial stuff. We've got Pomerantz says, we've got a whole slew of financial exhibits. We'll see when we get access to this. Yeah, things kind of slow down here. Pending getting all these exhibits, the current one shows a wire transfer between Epstein and Galen Maxwell. We've got 7.4 million bucks, according to this guy. Now he's being asked about a helicopter purchase. We've got different exhibits. They're shown on the screen. They're all blurry, and so we can't really see anything about what's going on here. Maxwell's lawyer says this document doesn't go into approved it, though, right? Yes, the statement does not. Okay, so uh, pretty something pretty simple here is happening. Basically, it's, it's Patrick McHugh, J.P. Morgan Chase, just coming out and confirming a couple of transactions happened. And that's really all he testifies about. We get a little bit more detail here from uh, the New York Post. He was a really quick witness, so not much came out of him. One transaction, October 19th, 1999, says, uh, showed that 18.3 million was wired to Maxwell's Bear Stearns account, 18.3 million. Another 5 million funneled over to Maxwell in 2002. Where is that money coming from? Was questioned wire transfers between Glenn Maxwell's account. We're talking about 23.3 million bucks. J.P. Morgan, Jeffrey Epstein, a lot of money. So we, we, basically all these are showing is that these transfers took place. Epstein's defense attorneys are saying, so what? They don't show who approved it, right? They just show that it happened. Doesn't mean that Jeffrey Epstein did it. Doesn't mean that Golin Maxwell did it. They're worth billions of dollars. Do you know how many, how many you know, millions of dollars that they funnel all over the place? 22.3 million. That's tip money, man. That's tip money. All right, so they continue, and that's it. That's all we get out of him. And then our final, uh, we got fi two final witnesses of the day. This is Miss Kelly McGuire. And again, a lot of these people, because they're government, uh, you know, police, if we can't see them, we can't identify a photograph for them. And so they have, of course, the most generic names ever, Kelly McGuire. All right, so not going to find anything about her. Miss Kelly McGuire, we have an FBI person who is... Uh, Standing in for her as a photograph, she is now testifying. All right. Prosecutor says, all right, Miss McGuire, Special Agent McGuire, what do you see here? Well, this is the front view of the residence at 9 East 71st Street. Recognize that address? 
Oh yeah, that's Epstein's New York residence. Oh, very curious. So they went over there and said, when there was no response, we forced our way in. Remember when they raided his property back in 2019? This is what we're talking about now. Prosecutor says, okay, when you were searching and raiding Epstein's place, did you come across the massage room on the third floor? Yeah, we did. And uh, this photo, 902R, is the entrance to the massage room. What about 903R? Well, that's actually the massage room. Pictures on the walls are redacted. Remember, we were talking about some of those pictures. I think there was a picture of a young, I think it was a young gal, you know, sort of a young girl, maybe sort of, you know, naked, I think is how the testimony was. I forget what it was, but concerning images for anybody. And so what the defense said is we can't let the jurors see those. If they see those, it's going to be too damning for our client. If they see those, that's just going to be enough. They're just going to go, oh God, that photo, that guy's a pedophile. Don't even need to talk about it anymore because he's got that on his wall. Yeah, that's it. So the defense is saying it's wait. Look, we're not, we're not on trial for having disgusting photos on your wall. Okay. We're on trial for these specific allegations. If somebody sees a disgusting photo on your wall and they presume, maybe rightfully so, that they can make a logical conclusion that because you had a photograph here that you're guilty of this, it might be true, but that's not logically consistent. Okay, one thing is not necessarily connected to the other. You don't get to convict somebody of a crime just because a bunch of stuff doesn't feel right. This guy's weird. He's got all these weird things going on. But you need, you need more there because a lot of people are very weird. We don't want all those people going to jail. So they're fighting over this. And you can see here that the pictures are actually being redacted. So when the jurors are seeing these images, the, the, those disgusting photos on the wall, they're not seeing those. So the defense is saying, look, we want just a, a clear shake, a clear, clean shot at this. Decide whether she did these acts that are alleged in the indictment. Don't let these pictures or these, you know, torpedoes or cucumbers or pickles or any of these other things out there make their way into the minds of the jurors and overly bias them overly you know become overly prejudicial so they're trying to throw that stuff out and it's uh working Look, looks like it's working now because we don't get much testimony from from these individuals a lot of this stuff is images right showing showing us what they were were doing back then when she was a part of this raid we can poke around a little bit and see what actually happened back in 2019? So I think that we are going to see a lot of these exhibits that came out during the FBI testimony today. But rather than wait for those things, let's see if we can piece some of this together. So we saw that from the New York Post that back in 2019, you see this article posted July 8th, 2019, that the feds found a vast trove of photos in his safe. And this is in his New York apartment. Remember, the, we, we've talked a lot about this place. This is what the outside door looked like. This is an FBI agent who's carrying uh, evidence taken from Epstein's Upper East Side townhouse. And so we've seen sort of the, the front photograph of this many different times. It's in the indictment and a number of different uh, number of different angles of it. But this was from this prosecution back then in 2019. We had a different U.S. attorney who was in charge there. This is Jeffrey Berman. Now we've got Damian Williams. But, you know, they were saying, hey. You recognize this person. If you're a victim, call FBI, 1-800. We got an 800 number. Call us. And so this is what they're talking about. So as I mentioned at the start of the show, when we were going through the Palm Beach residence, when we were sort of, you know, meandering around through because Parkinson was communicating about what he saw. And then we heard from Dawson who told us what he saw. Same thing is going to happen here out of New York. We just basically ran out of time. So we're going to pick back up with that tomorrow. Let's wrap up testimony from Inner City Press all right, McGuire's done. So it's at, uh, it's, you know, it's got like 10 minutes left in the court date. Judge Nathan, who is a stickler for time. All right, government, we got, we got like 10 minutes left. You have anybody else you can squeeze in here? Prosecutor says, uh, yeah, actually we do. Uh, does each FBI investigation have its own number? The agent says, yeah. Uh, calls up another FBI agent. All right, did you review CDs in 2020? Yeah, I did it with somebody else called Amelia Young. And I don't know what the name of this FBI agent is. And so that's it. Prosecution says, all right, we offer into evidence this photo of Jeffrey Epstein and Glenn Maxwell. So yet another photo. We got 10 minutes in. One FBI agent checks in and out. Judge Nathan says, all right, 
I guess we're going to break for the day then. Jurors, have a good night. Counsel, anything else? Maxwell's attorneys say, yeah. We object to the photo of our client lying on the boat. And so that's what we have today. Galen Maxwell trial, day six. I don't think we have any other updates today. No, we do not. So sort of a, a full full court date, but a lot of this is going to be able to be unpacked not today because a lot of exhibits came out. We can see that they were talking about a lot of different photographs all took place in that New York property. And so as soon as those exhibits start to trickle out, we'll update the mind map. Of course, you can now view the mind map. If you remember over at watching the watchers.locals.com as we continue to update it in the meantime, let's see what you have to say over from our friends at watching the watchers.locals.com and little Panda cub gave us a super chat. Uh, Legal Eagle was not in that uh, group, in that group chat, but thank you for asking about that little panda cup. All right. So let's see what else we've got at watching the watchers.locals.com. All right. So we're going to get out of the mind map. Couple questions here before we get up out of here for the day. We got Sergeant Bob is here says uh, greetings from the always beautiful and sunny Chino Valley, Arizona. I like the rulings on the artwork and the toys. And admission of the school uniforms makes a lot of sense. Good judge so far. Artwork and the toys. Yeah, as those might be overly prejudicial. Admission of the school uniforms makes a lot of sense. Good judge so far from Sergeant Bob. I agree with you, Sergeant Bob. I think pretty, you know, pretty fair rulings, I think, thus far. I don't, I don't see them. I don't see this judge being too one-sided, one way or the other. Yet, we're still in the early phases of this thing. English Dave says... Rob, have you ever noticed if you swap your initials, then you become gob ruler? Is that accurate? Are you a gob ruler? Wow. Well, I don't know. I mean, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Sort of sounds like a, a gob ruler. Gob stoppers are good. Good question, English Dave. I don't know. If it's a bad thing, probably. Thunder7 says, chill, dude. Nobody cares. They know you as Rob the Lawyer and a YouTuber. Yes. Okay. So yeah, I don't want to indulge this too much. So thank you for the, for the support Thunder seven. Yeah. So, so I was just, I was just eating crow for myself, but I don't want to indulge it too much. Thank you for your support Thunder seven. They're, they're, they're all a bunch of good people over there. So I'm sure they'll get it. Monster one says, uh, I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> okay. So, okay. Uh, the only appropriate action to getting that message would have been to steal the content. Think you're being a little hard on yourself. Pretty sure they knew you were talking about legal Schmeagel and other people outside your group. My first thought was, I wonder if they can add Hunter and Joe Biden to it. LOL. Yeah, <laughs> I can do that. I can do that. No, look, look, I, I know I am making a big deal about it, but I just felt like a buffoon and I thought it would be a funny story to come and share with you because it, it, you know, it's like, look, we all do boneheaded stuff from time to time and I stepped in it today. So as pure as the freshly fallen snow says, not sure what rooms you were looking for. What were you really expecting them to show? Public whips, chains, straps, dominatrix, paraphernalia? Epstein certainly wasn't the top for anything. <laughs> this is a family show, and you didn't put a name on there. All right, so um, yeah, swings, you know, swings. Well, we got the torpedoes in there, so, you know, that's another thing. A lot of activity. Spawn Dog says, if you can't trust the good folks at the FBI, who can you trust? Come on, Rob. Read off last week's comment. All parties involved are likely dead, and I'm the only one left. It happened like 30 years ago. Spawn Dog, I've totally lost track of what you're talking about now. Do we have a conversation about this last week? Thunder7 says, once again, they are trying to turn the attention to Trump, who never went to the island, never went on the express. It was Bill Clinton who went the frequent flyer on the plane and the island, and photos of him being massaged. 99% of the guests were Democrats, so not surprising that the Democrats, Southern District of New York, they want to divert attention. They are pathetic. That's from Thunder 7. Thank you for that, Thunder 7. They are, they are really taking every opportunity they can to, uh, to, to smear Trump's name. No question about that. They're, not, they're, they're using that name a lot more than the others. Now, the reason I think so is because this is a New York jury, and they're going to love that. They're going to love either side that comes in and just keeps smashing Trump because they're New Yorkers. Demographically speaking, I would think. Three Girlies says, first, I don't know how these jurors actually eat during this case. It's a good question. Like, how do you get up after your direct exam of Kate and you just walk in and you're like, man, this Hot Pocket, it's really hitting the spot right now. How's yours? What kind did you get? Pepperoni pizza. You know they got the garlic chicken over there. They do? 
Oh, well, I guess I'll go have to have that one. But your point is right, and I should make light of it. Next, Three Girly says, All right, sadly, the addiction goes along with the trauma. Might not remember a whole lot of things for a lot of reasons, but it sounds like the interaction with Kate started with Maxwell. It does make you wonder how many of these interactions truly started with Maxwell instead of Epstein. Yeah, it's, it's a good point, Three Girlies, and I think that, you know, it's like the yin and the yang to some degree. You know, you sort of need, like, both, both parts of this thing to work appropriately, like, you know, they're, they're both predators and they created an environment where they could support one another. You know, Epstein's got all these funds and, you know, nice things and uh, contacts and acquaintances and, and, you know, sort of he can show it. He's got the, the glitz and the glamour. Maxwell, you know, is sort of but, but he's a man and he can't kind of go insert himself into these into these situations. Glenn Maxwell, you know, is a socialite, British socialite, a lot of respect. People just, oh, well, she's great. And they just let her in there. And then she brings, which is exactly what the prosecutors are saying, that she is the person who is really the mastermind behind the grooming. Jeffrey Epstein, he's a predator. He's a disgusting creep and all of that. Yeah, that's fine. But he's just a big, dumb buffoon. He doesn't know anything. He needs a Galen Maxwell. He needs a yin to the yang to go out there and you know actually use that charisma, that charm, that seduction power to bring him in here. It's the frog in the boiling pot. Start it low and just turn that temperature up and boom, you're at stage five. Now you've got a full-blown uh, abuse case. But you can't really have it without either one. Like both are necessary in order for the situation to develop. If it's just Galen, well, she doesn't have Epstein's money. If it's just Epstein, well, she doesn't have Galen's soft touch and her, her sort of ensnaring of the youth. And I think that's that's a, you know that's the prosecutor's most effective argument. The defense is going to say that they're just making this all about Epstein. Galen was a victim of Epstein. No, she was exactly on par. She was as bad as him, if not worse, because she was the person who was going out and doing stage one and stage two and stage three. Epstein, by by and large, was mostly just sort of the recipient of this. He just I want a massage, go get a girl. So they 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 need to. The prosecution needs to reclaim some of that villain and shove it right back on Maxwell. She was direct. She was directing all of this. Did you see even in the house manual? She said, don't look at me in the eyeballs. That's what an evil person she was. Remember Juan Alessi said, lady of the house. She was in charge of everything. Juan Alessi also said that when Galen Maxwell came in, the entire relationship between Juan and Jeffrey changed. They were buddies, J and J. Juan and Jeffrey just, you know, hanging out like old pals. And then Galen came in and everything changed. Ugh, he got a girlfriend. Don't you hate when that happens? Never returns my text, never shows up to the parties anymore. She's changed him, man. And that's exactly what happened. Galen changed Epstein and Juan didn't like it. They're calling him John now. So the whole thing became a gigantic problem. Not because of Epstein, because of Galen. She's the mastermind here. And so, three girlies, I think you're exactly right. And the prosecution is going to certainly key in on that. She was the groomer, not Epstein. A couple more questions here. We've got Mama Goob is here. Uh, how exactly does one maintain homes in Palm Beach and a private island while, quote, needing and obtaining three massages a day when one is in their 40s and at the theoretical busiest time in one's career? And not a trust fund baby. Well, he, he had a lot of money. I can't even fit one massage a weekend. That would be if I could afford it on my measly accountant salary in the Brandon economy. Again, I still believe this whole case is frustrating, waste of time. I'm never going to get to these really substantive questions, answers. I have a deep-seated desire to follow the money in this case. And I doubt that that will ever happen. That's from Mama Goob. Yeah, well, you know, he's worth many, many hundreds of millions, if not billions. I don't know if he's a billionaire, but a lot of money, a lot of money. And so, yeah, he had massages and masseuses that just followed him around. So it's a lot easier to have massages if you just say, sounds good right now, let's go. You know, and you have nothing else to do because you're a hundred millionaire billionaire. And I guess, I guess your job maybe is to just ensnare people in your little honey pots. Maybe that is your job. Who knows? Good to see you, Mama Goob. Greg Marat says, hey, Rob, sorry I couldn't reply last Friday. I was driving, but I was listening. I'm glad you liked it. And yes, it's similar theme to rugby, but also different. Hey, by the way, can you see it back there? It's right back there. So Greg got, sent me that, that Australian 
uh, football, Australian rules football, direct from Australia, one of the coolest things ever. It was adopted from the Aboriginal game called Marnagrug, actually older than Australia is a country. Amazing. Oldest club in Australia is the Melbourne Football Club, back to 1858, also my favorite club. However, we're terrible. Last time we won a championship was in 1964. Until this year, all the players who brought home the championship championship after almost 60 years are on your ball. That's so awesome, dude. Super cool. Also, sorry to hear about Mind Map Gate. <laughs> Uh, can you can redeem yourself by making the Melbourne Football Club the official AFL team of watching the Watchers? Our sandals include losing so badly during the season that we get first draft picks the following year. Yeah, so what do I get demoted to on Lot Tube? I, I got demoted. What am I? <laughs> first, do I get first draft pick? All right, it's pretty good. That's pretty good. Maybe there's a, a silver lining here, Greg. And thank you so much for sending that. I love it. I put it right back up there behind me. Uh, it's super cool. I don't know much about it, Australian rules football. But uh, several people actually on Rumble were commenting about that. And so I, I was like, I didn't even almost... I literally didn't know that was a thing even. So I've got a lot to learn. But you're educating me, and I appreciate it. A couple more. Three Girly says, no, a regular music teacher cannot be a musical therapist. And an art therapist is not the same thing as a teacher either. These therapists specialize in therapies that deal with art and music. They take extra training and certifications outside of becoming a counselor or therapist. Not just any therapist is trained to deal with trauma either. There are special trainings and certification too. Sternheim was definitely trying to muddy the water with that kind of questioning. You're right about that, three girlies. It's very condescending, isn't it? Oh, a music teacher. Yeah. What kind of music do you teach? Uh, trauma music. Oh, really? People who are traumatized? Like with drums and stuff and like you bang on drums. Yeah. Do you need special credentials for that? Right. And so you, you, like three girlies, if you're on that jury and you're hearing Bobby Sternheim like lace into this woman. Oh, you're a ther You're a music therapist. Got it. Okay. Being condescending like that, right? you're instantly turned off. You don't like the defense at all. If you're somebody, you know, of a different mindset maybe you do legal eagle is here oh what a jerk off topic says everyone should come check out my new mind map video on the glenn maxwell trial i just made it <laughs> this is why i had to talk about it because i needed i needed to just get some abuse and just get out of the system you know oh, monster one says sorry but i don't believe kate she's obviously a gold digger who willingly put herself in the situation she saw the epstein compensation fund and saw dollar signs that's from monster one. Ooh, monster one that's a spicy one are you blaming the victim here good to see you uh we have a speech unleashed says that pink blue and pastel decorating style of the room seemed aimed at younger females very interesting speech yeah or, or, or was that just the 90s thing i don't know yeah i guess i mean look like there was some weird stuff going on with those photos and those pictures because we saw the pictures of sort of the uh, the, the the Barney lookalike kind of looked like a, like a Barney doll it was in a picture with all the little uh, gems and stuff around it some, something that you might see like in a young girl's room but like Epstein wasn't like they weren't like you know that young they weren't you know eight years old I think. You know, these were sort of, you know, 14, I think, was the lowest that we got. And a 14-year-old girl, they're not going and going, oh, that's Barbie or, or, or that's uh, Barney. So what's the pink, what's with the pink couches and the pink's room is and all that, right? I, I don't know. I don't, the whole, the whole stinking thing is just so weird. Can't even make sense of it. I don't know. Monster One says, tell Thunder 7 to remember Trump used to be a Democrat until 16. He used to be friends with Hillary until he ran against her. Obama said Trump was the American dream until he switched sides. Yeah, they're all political, you know, losers. They all just point, fears at, point fingers at each other. Spawn Dog is here, says, you feared it was a legal scenario about a lunatic who maced me and an incompetent DA who, after using me, left, out, left me out to drive. Like I said, it was 30 years ago. All parties are dead. <laughs> it was about how prosecutors use victims as pawns, like me being used by that DA. Okay, so Spawn Dog resend that uh, i'm happy to share it i just got to be careful about not sharing too much personal information right because it's your it's your case i'm not your lawyer but i just my instinct is just you know be careful about that all right let's see what else we've got we have 
Former LEO is here, says uh, usually in these types of cases, a co-conspirator started out as a victim and was groomed into the position of procurer. Co-conspirator was also a victim. Yeah, so start out as being abused and then you become the abuser. Elevate yourself. We sort of saw that with that Nexium case. You know, they actually had like a hierarchy of abuse. You, you sort of work your way up to the top and then you go out and recruit other people. Almost like a 12-step program or something. It was ridiculous. All right, and our last question here on the day, a little short show, Monster One says, Rob, if you take the first letter of, the, of each word in Australian Greg's message, it says, help, I'm being held hostage by my government. So I saw that, Monster One. I didn't want to reveal it. If you look further, you'll also note that he embedded his GPS coordinates in there. So uh, Monster One, myself, I think chairman of the boards here, we've got former LEO Sergeant Bob's here, uh, all the guys with you know, a little bit of experience in this stuff, we're in route, Greg. Hang tight. We're coming for you, brother. All right. And so that, my friends, is it for us for the day. Let me make sure I uh, give some final shout outs over on YouTube. Look who's over there. We've got Lauren S. We've got Tito Bandito. We've got T. Joes. We've got Narrow Deep. Texas Beast is here. What's up, Zulu? We've got Ninth Chamber. Mel Stiller. We've got Samantha Richardson. We've got Con Assy is here says, check out Ryan Dawson and learn things that will not be brought up in this trial. He went over this in 2008, by the way. That's from Con Assey. So let's take a look at this Ryan Dawson fellow. Is Ryan Dawson over on YouTube there? Let's see if he's on YouTube and, and maybe give him a little bit of a shout out on this. All right. So Ryan, well, this looks like a sort of a random Ryan Dawson. Probably not the one that you're talking about. How about the Ryan Dawson channel? uh, mass removal. Uh Oh, well, I don't know what's going on. So yeah, so I'm having a hard time finding Ryan Dawson, but I'll keep looking for him and see if anything comes in on that one. But he covered this in 2008. I know a lot of people have been covering this for a long time. So Ryan has been banned from YouTube is what they're telling me. Not good. All right. And let's see what's going on over at locals. I see speech unleashed is in the house. We've got Radice is here. We've got uh, ginger cross says, Ginger Cross just joined up and following over on Rumble and now just joined up. Welcome, Ginger Cross. Let's see. We saw Radices over there. And then actually over on Rumble, we've got Adam CSC. Rob, the only problem I have with you is that a lot of your streams are at the same time as Viva's, which is fair. Uh, Dershowitz. Dershowitz was not in that group, actually. Australian rules, football players. Yeah, so we've got Adam CSC. We've got TC. TYCH News are over on Locals. Angela K is over. I'm sorry. Those are all over on Rumbles, over on Locals. We already read those. And so that, my friends, is it for me for the day. I want to thank you for being here, being a part of the show. Thank you for letting me indulge in my uh, galactic blunder of the day. Hopefully somebody laughs at that and has fun with that. But we're going to be back here to do it all again tomorrow because we've got Glenn Maxwell trial day seven. We've got a lot of... Uh, you know, a lot of runway left on this runway because we've got, I think, until mid-January of witnesses and closings and case in chiefs being presented by both sides. And we want you to be a part of it. So make sure you hit that subscribe button and stick around. We're going to be back here same time, same place tomorrow to do it all again. And I want to see you there. So uh, 4 p.m. Arizona time, 5 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. on the East Coast. And for that one Florida man, everybody else, have a tremendous evening. Sleep very well. I'll see you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.